Hello friends, this video on NEET genetics is brought to you by examfear.com. No more fear from exam. The number of base, question number 36, the number of base substitution possible in amino acid codons is 261, 264, 535 or 549. So even before we start solving this question, what do we mean by base substitution? So base substitution basically refers to the phenomenon in which a nitrogen base is changed with another nitrogen base. Now there are two types of base substitutions which are possible, transition and transversion. So transition means nitrogen base is replaced with another nitrogen base of its types. Now what are the types of nitrogen bases? So you have all these nitrogen bases, adenine, guanine, cytosine, thiamine, uracil. So adenine and guanine, they fall under the category of purine and cytosine, thiamine and uracil, they fall under the category of pyrimidine. So these are the two types of nitrogen bases. Now in transition, what happens is a purine gets replaced with a purine. Similarly, a pyrimidine gets replaced with a pyrimidine. So that is transition. Now when we talk about the next type of base substitution that is transversion, here a nitrogen base is replaced with another of the other type. That means in this case, a purine gets replaced with a pyrimidine and vice versa. That is a pyrimidine gets replaced with a purine. So that is transversion. So now let us try to calculate how many total base substitutions are possible in amino acid codons. Now first of all, how many amino acid codons do we have? So total how many such codons exist which codes for amino acids? So there are such 61 amino acid codons because total 64 codons exist out of which 3 codons are nonsense codons. So they do not code for amino acids. So total 61 amino acid codons exist. Now each of these codons is made up of 3 nitrogenous bases. So you pick up any uh, amino acid codon for example AUG, AGU, UGA. So each of these codon is made up of 3 bases. Right? So if you talk about the number of base substitutions possible, so how do we find that? Now each base can undergo substitution in two ways. Right? So each base can either undergo transition or it can undergo transversion. So you can say like this that each codon has three bases and each base can undergo substitution in two ways, right? So that means if each base can undergo substitution in two ways, then in how many ways three bases can undergo substitution? So out of these three bases, let us say the three bases are A, B, C. So A can undergo substitution in two ways, similarly B can also undergo substitution in two ways, similarly C can also undergo substitution in two ways, right? So these are the various ways in which A, B and C can undergo substitutions. So we can say that one codon can undergo substitution in 3 to the power 2 ways, that means 9 ways. So basically, this is what one codon can do because one codon has three bases. Now each base has option of both transition and transversion, right? So for every base, like for the three bases which you have, every base will have these two options, right? So 3 to the power 2, which is 9. So each codon can undergo 9 base substitutions. 9 base substitutions are possible for each codon. So how many total codons do you have? You have 61 codons. 61 into 9 which is equal to 549. So a total of 549 base substitution reactions are possible. Question number 37. DNA template sequence of CTGA TAGC is transcribed over mRNA as so it's complementary strand basically so for C it would be G for T it would be A for
for G it would be C, for A it would be U, for T it would be A, for A it is U, G, C, C, G. So just remember the base pairing rule. A always pairs up with T and C always pairs up with G. Now in case of mRNA, in case of RNA, instead of T, you would have U. So if you remember this, you will be able to answer these kind of questions. So here G A C U A U C G. So B is the right option. Question number 38. Nucleotide arrangement in DNA can be seen by X-ray crystallography, electron microscope, ultracentrifuge or light microscope. So now when you talk about the DNA molecule, DNA is one of the large macromolecules. However, when you talk about the diameter of DNA, so the diameter of DNA is in nanometers, like it's 2 nanometers, in the range of 2 nanometers, which is 20 angstrom. When you talk about the length of the DNA, the length of the DNA is in few millimeters. Now, when you compare all of these methods, you see that X-ray crystallography is a method which is uh, which is one of the most effective method to obtain the atomic model of a molecule. So in case of DNA also, when you look at the arrangement of the nucleotides, you actually get using X-ray crystallography where a beam of X-ray is incident to diffract into many specific directions so that you get a three-dimensional picture of the structure. So X-ray crystallography gives us a very nice three-dimensional structure of DNA. So this is the method by which nucleotide arrangement in DNA is seen. So talking about the other options, ultracentrifuge is not at all applicable because ultracentrifuge is a method which is used to separate larger bi biological molecules from solution or to separate them by their different rates of sedimentation. So that is basically a technique to separate substances from each other. So that's ultra centrifuge. So that is definitely not applicable. If you talk about light microscopes and electron microscopes, so compared to light microscope, electron microscopes has a higher resolving power. But then when you talk about the structure of DNA, you are expecting um, uh, even better resolving power. So electron microscopes resolving power is better than light microscope but x-ray crystallography gives an uh, even better resolution or it, it is a more effective method than electron microscope as well. So therefore x-ray crystallography is used to see the nucleotide arrangement in DNA. Question number 39. E. coli fully labeled with N15 is allowed to grow in N14 medium. So, can you remember which experiment is this? Exactly, it's the misselson stahl experiment. The two strands of DNA molecule of the first generation bacteria have different density and do not resemble parent DNA, different density but resemble parent DNA, same density and resemble parent DNA, same density but do not resemble parent DNA. So if you quickly recall the misselson stahl experiment, you would see that in the F1 generation, it was found that the two strands of the DNA, one strand was made up of nitrogen 14, the other strand was N15. So it was basically of intermediate density. So it, its density was not the same as the parent DNA so it was of a different density so it was neither of the density of N14 nor of the density of N15 it was of intermediate density such that one strand is N14 one strand is N15 so out of these options obviously it was of of different density but resemble parent DNA Thank you. Please visit examfear.com for free quality education. You can learn with a simple four-step learning process wherein you can watch video lessons, you can ask your questions, you can refer notes and you can take a free online test. We have content for class 6 to 12 on physics, chemistry, mathematics and biology along with practical videos. So please subscribe to our channel for daily updates. Thank you.